Take two. Just gonna back up, right? There we go. Good evening, everyone. I'm Douglas Hill, co-director of Pasadena Photography Arts. Thank you for joining us. Forum is sponsored by Pasadena Photography Arts, a project of the nonprofit Emerge program at Fulcrum Arts. Our mission is to promote diverse photography projects by established and emerging photographers worldwide through in-person and virtual exhibitions. In addition, PPA is committed to sponsoring educational programs by accomplished photography professionals. To achieve the mission, PPA's ongoing monthly programming includes Open Show Pasadena and PPA Forum. We're also in the process of developing new programs, so please stay tuned. Pasadena Photography Arts presents a monthly program here on Zoom. The forum alternates with Open Show each month. These programs are free to attend, but they cost money to put on. To keep them free, we ask that you donate whatever you can by visiting our website, PasadenaPhotographyArts.org and clicking on one of the hard to miss donate buttons. For those of you who have not experienced Open Show, it's an international platform now in 31 cities in 15 countries designed to give photographers at all levels an opportunity to show and discuss their creative projects. If you would like to submit your project to Open Show, go to openshow.org select submit a project, then scroll down to our venue. We are OS-Pasadena East LA. Since we began, we've helped over 130 photographers get their work in front of an audience, many of them for the first time. While we welcome your donations, we also want your feedback. If you have comments or suggestions, please email us at one of the addresses on our website. By the way, the May installation um, installment of uh, Open Show will be hosted by the incomparable uh, Roland Spatugan on the theme of change. Roland says about the theme, our worlds, whether personal or global, are in constant flow. This change can manifest itself through identity, environments, or it can appear on the social and political stages. Through your lens, submit work that captures this state of flux. Tonight's event has been made possible in part through a very generous grant from the Pasadena Arts League. One great way you can help out is by underwriting one of these events yourself. Email us to find out how. You can follow and like us on Facebook and Instagram. And I'd like to point out that although the audience will be muted for the duration of the event, Everyone will have the opportunity to type questions and comments into the chat box whenever you like. The event is also being recorded and will be made available on Pasadena Photography Arts YouTube channel. I'd also like to mention that our guest speaker has very generously donated a signed copy of her out of print book, War Photography, Images of Armed Conflict and Its Aftermath to our raffle. In addition, PPA founder, Bill Wishner has made several copies of his book, artifacts available, which will be raffled off as well. If you want a chance to win one of these exceptional publications, there's still time to make a donation via the Pasadena Photography Arts website. Winners will be drawn tomorrow. Well, thank you, thank you, Doug. Uh, sure. I'd, like to, I'd like to welcome well, Anne. Well, Go actually, ahead. let Did me first, something? yeah, Debbie, let me first introduce you. Um, everybody, this is uh, Debbie Arlook, um, who is one of PPA's advisors. Thank you. Thanks for being here, everybody. We appreciate it. We know how precious time is, and Zoom is all-encompassing. This is our, our, our Zoom living room these days. Uh, so again, I really want to thank Anne and welcome Anne. We're thrilled to have you present Time and Place. Time and Place is exploring boundary pushing photography, featuring the work of Mark Clett and Terry Evans, who are in the audience. I want to say hello and thank you for being here as well. And I want to personally thank Anne though for saying yes to our invitation, knowing how full your schedule is. We benefit and welcome this encore of your retirement. Uh, so. And I'd like to introduce you by sharing a morsel of your prestigious career with everyone. 
Ann Wilkes Tucker is a curator emerita of the Museum of Fine Arts, it's Houston. Having in 1976 become founding curator of the photography department, for which she acquired over 30,000 photographs made on all seven continents. She curated or co-curated over 40 exhibitions, most with accompanying catalogs, including surveys on the Czech avant-garde, the history of Japanese photography, and the history of war photography, as well as exhibi exhibitions with catalogs on works of Robert Frank, Versailles, Catherine Wagner, Joel Sternfeld, Richard Mizrach, Ray Metzger, Louis Farrar, George Krauss, and Chen Changfang. Debbie, she your paper also... is in front of your camera. Oh. There you go. Oh gosh, hey guys, guess what? You were not supposed to know I'm reading. <laughs> and then years off so you know what this is this is uh what was it the little rascals hey kids let's put on the show but we have a big heavy hitter so we're still i'm learning thank you thank you doug um and where was i Anne has contributed articles to over 150 magazines books and other catalogs and she's lectured all over the world she received an honorary doctorate from the college of brockport suny as an honorary fellowship from the Royal Photographic Society and has been a trustee for the Philip and Edith Lannan Foundation. He served as a trustee of Randolph College and PhotoFest and is now trustee emerita of both institutions. While continuing to work in retirement, though friends have pronounced her a failure at retirement, we know. She's an active gardener, movie buff and reader. She resides with her life partner, Robert Morris, who's an architect and painter. It is an honor to have you present with us tonight. Thank you. And you can unmute yourself so we make sure we can hear you. It's still lower left hand corner. Just click the microphone icon. I see so many wonderful faces out there. Hi, everybody. And you're still muted. There you go. There we go. Okay. Super. Thank you, Anne. Hi. Um, first, I want to thank Debbie and Douglas for this invitation and for working together to get it all presented. Um, I want to thank my friends in the audience, particularly Mark and Terry, um, who are um, the respect for their photography came first, but um, the friendship has been wonderful. Um, I'm gonna read this lecture because um, I've quoted both artists and I wanna be accurate. Um, and the topic of the lecture um, focuses on the conceptual relationship of time and place in their work. Um, but there's so many other aspects to their photography that um, both have excellent websites. And so I really encourage you to avail yourselves to looking at the other art and even more art in the projects that I am talking about um, because they have really these wonderful websites. Okay. Over the past four decades, Mark Clett and Terry Evans have chosen primarily to photograph landscapes seeking to engage audiences by making substantive and compelling pictures. Their decisions may be quickly made, but preceded by contemplation. They are not in any particular place by chance. Each photographer has identified something they wanted to see freshly and then preserve. The complexities of their photographs involve diverse technologies different seasons and times of day during which they intentionally work, their individual knowledge about each place's history and its evolution, the artistic traditions that precede them, and finally and most critically, the aesthetic inquiries that drive their practice of art. Prior work leads to new pictures. They share an interest in human connections to the natural world and in the planet's endangered ecosystems. They both focus on the relationship of time and place as a primary concept embodied in their pictures, a relationship that has shifted as their careers evolved. 
As Mark often notes, it's not the place, but our perceptions that change. Doug, there we go. Each photographer identified a geographic re region early in their careers that became a recurring subject. Born in Kansas, Terry began and repeatedly returned to the North American prairies, stretching south from North Dakota to Texas. Mark has surveyed the deserts and mountains of the American West, stretching from Idaho and Montana to the southern borders of Arizona and New Mexico. Both photographers are aware that their photographs are of the moment and simultaneously include evidence of prior geological times. Their images notate important aspects of time, celestial time and terrestrial time. Regarding celestial time, they have both photographed stages of the moon and the movement of stars. Cycles of the earth have included seasons of plants and seasons of tourists. Mark has emphasized his awareness of time from ancient to present in the titles of two books. His recent retrospective monograph is titled Seeing Time, 40 Years of Photographs, published in 2020, and a prior monograph titled Yosemite in Time. Evans cherished returning to the prairies of her childhood, which were formed over 9,000 years ago following the retreat of the great glaciers. She's been particularly fascinated by the special prairies that seem never have been plowed and which support profound botanical complexity. Some of these special prairies are protected from human or mechanical interventions whenever possible. Only 15% of such undisturbed ecosystems, what is called a virgin prairie, is visible above ground. The other 85% lies below the surface where roots can extend 15 to 20 feet into the ground. You can imagine the delight of scientists to have such a um, extraordinary complexity of available to study. From her first visit, Evans was captivated while standing in one place for an hour. Looking down, she could see a fraction of the plants intertwined structures in the area around her feet. This new experience led to a shallow space pictures of grasses intertwined graphic lines instead of the deep space perspective of traditional expansive view landscapes. She relished the variety of textures, patterns, and forms within these intimate spaces. With extended time, she learned many of the plant's poetic names, silverleaf sculpey, nodding ladies' tresses, green antelope horn. I felt embarrassed, she said, when I came across one whose name I'd forgotten or hadn't yet learned. It was like slighting a friend. While photographing during different seasons in Virgin and other prairies, she learned to recognize their cyclical systems of growth based on the diversity and the self-renewal of perennial plants. Evans has published five books of her photographs on prairies. In the 1960s, Evans began two projects, aerial surveys of mixed grass prairies, as well as exploring, at 1990s, uh, exploring the grass line specialists, specimens collected by naturalists in 19th century and deposited in Chicago's Field Museum and the Smithsonian Collections. Con collected to preserve, um, she photographed dried plants, feathers, animals, with their careful labels, collected to preserve as evidence and for study. She identifies with playwright Mary Zimmerman's statement that scientific inquiry into the ways of the world is an act of sustained, intense attention, which is another way of saying an act of love. For aerial photographs, she worked with two pilots flying from 700 to 1,000 feet high after sunrise and before sunset to take advantage of slanting sunlight to define the prairie shapes. 
high enough to see patterns and low enough to see structure in animals. She referred to the pilots as her dance partners so that by motioning her hands, she could bank the plane or circle the location for another shot. She collected the statistics about the profound disappearance of the prairies, such as the fact that of the 30 million acres of original prairie that once covered Iowa, only 10,000 prairie um, acres remain. Both Evans and Klett have included evidence of human interaction with the land. From the air, Evans wanted to study patterns of common use as well as any severe degradation of military installations and, in, and industrial operations such as fracking in North Dakota, which she photographed. She did a complete project about pet coke industrial pollution in the city of Chicago. Here, her aerial views feature large swaths of land with less intrusive common structures, such as homes, churches, and freight trains, carving out sections through the undulating earth. Evans has also recorded these beautiful patterns of plowed terraces fed by structured grass waterways. Mark has trained as a geologist, so he's qualified to identify the strata of the mesa near Canesville, Utah, as well as the more recent vehicular traffic of the playa. He looks for such juxtapositions from of ancient formations and recent human presence, both as an encapsulation of time and an ecological disturbance. On various field trips, Klett has documented recently abandoned shell casings, as well as prehistoric stone and ceramic fragments. Such fragments indicate that prehistoric people somehow use this piece of land. Thus, time is compressed into contemporary life. Stones that were originally held by prehistoric hands now held by a living hand. He recognizes the historical relevance of these items and collects them, just as earlier science collected the specimens at the Field Museum that Evans later collected with her camera. For Evans' newest series, um, Ancient Prairies, um, she walks and studies photographs um, and studies and photographs to collect images, but no longer make single image presentations. The different sightings recorded on different days and times of day at each site are then edited and placed in large scale digital collages once she returns to Chicago. In these yet unplowed areas, this new collaging of multiple observations over time gives her a greater opportunity to show both the plethora of plants and flowers in a spring and summer and the brittle stalks of winter. To create the work Night, April 2020, Evans photographed throughout the pandemic's first April, working from dusk when the sun's reflections of pink light appear on the horizon to the pitch darkness of prairie night. Knight is also a recorded memory of walks through the prairie grass with her husband, Sam. Later in Chicago, she created the montage of images that vertically rise from dusk to clear indigo, which is how the camera reads the sky's color just before night. Then she digitally stitches the images together, grateful to the meteorite that animated the sky one night. And you can see that in the sky. Time in these images is not linear. These are poetic associations collected and arranged to evoke more than, than to describe. Night preserved a collection of nights without light pollution. Evans also used multiple exposures to photograph one of Chicago's oldest trees, spring, burr oak, April, May, 2019. A famous tree in Chicago known for its gangly curving limbs that span 90 feet across. The tree is a popular place to walk, as you can see in the lower or mid um, 
left hand of the picture. Um, Evans chose to photograph the tree in daylight during April and May 2019, starting with the tree was still without leaves and working through the yellow green sprouts of early spring toward the dark green leaves of summer. Her compilation extends time within the picture, revealing the, the gentle changes of seasons. Mark has consciously dwelled into time as a primary component of his projects. From the first rephotographic survey project conducted in the late 70s to the publication of his retrospective monograph, the passage of time has been an embedded concept in most of his projects. Concurrent with his increasing attention to the properties of time is his awareness of the physical changes of topography impacted by human intervention, which is also connected to the passage of time in ways more complicated that might seem obvious. His first major project at a graduate school was a collaboration with Joanne Verberg and Ellen Manchester. They invented the term rephotographic to identify their attention to track down locations of historical photographs made by 19th century photographers of the American West and make new photographs of those sites that were meant to duplicate and document the changes occurring from the original images. For the rephotographic survey project, they sought to repeat the original image camera position, the visual composition, the framing, time of year and time of day. They were curious how the original sites had changed in over a hundred years. In three different field seasons, they rephotographed the locations of pictures by William Henry Jackson, Timothy O'Sullivan, John Hillers, Andrew Wussel, and others. By the 19th century, they used view cameras, but replaced collodion glass negatives with Polaroid type 55 black and white film so that they could make comparisons of the new pictures with copies of the originals with which they traveled and to make adjustments to their images as necessary. Between eight, 1982, when Kleck moved to Arizona in two, 4, 000, until 2004, when Polaroid's Type 55 film was removed from the market, he made thousands of photographs of the landscapes of the Southwest and the history of human interaction with the land. This series is titled Revealing Territory, but is not just about the land. Kept, Klet kept a human presence in the picture. Um, on the left, if you look, you can see a person, and on the right, um, you can see a shadow. Um, and he, this keeping of human presence is here in various ways. Here, it's the person or the shadow. In other places, it's just the presence of a hat. Part of his insistence um, it is in, in doing this, unlike Ansel Adams, Klett allowed no illusions about that this is what a viewer would see without the photographer. A reference to both the 19th century photography practices and Klett felt to, snap, uh, to snapshots in family albums was his insistence to write on the bottom of the picture, um, as you can see, not well in, in, you know, in this, but it's there in this beautiful silver. Um, another choice was to leave the border residue um, of the Polaroid film visible, framing the picture and noting the process. He's saying, this is the picture that I chose to make. Occasionally, he made photographs from the series for the series revealing territory that were of subjects that were also photographed by the 19th century photographers, but from a different time of day and different perspectives and his own pictorial conservation. Um, and I, I, I chose this one just because um, I think it's a dance um, of these of these towering um, balancing rocks. Fascinating. Um, 
The next series is the third view, made 1997 to 2000, in collaboration with some of his graduate students. Both of the images um, from Third View and shown tonight were made by Byron Wolf, who was continued to work with Mark on, on several subsequent projects. Klett and his graduate students returned to places photographed 20 years earlier by Klett for Second View, but using digital technologies. They made two versions of Pyramid Lake. This one is closer to the Second View format with only the level of the water in the lake shifting. In the 1867 photograph, the 1979 photograph, and the 2000 views. The subsequent version changes perspectives in order to re-experience these historic places. Instead of three images made in different years and organized in chronologically horizontal display, Klett and Wolf in the second version of this site use their own contemporary color digital panorama of Pyramid Lake as the background into which they insert a segment of Timothy O'Sullivan's 1867 albumen print. Also, the photographers have inserted themselves into the third view scenes and they've abandoned the traditional rectangular form. Their self-insertions are a reminder that these pictures were conceived and executed through personal vision. Wolf called the insertions mashups of different times, experiences, and ways of looking at the place. It looks like we had the intention of reeling, revealing something about the medium, but that's not the driving question, what we're doing. It's more about being curious, having fun, and posing questions. The mashups continue in the next project with the writer Rebecca Solnick that became the book Yosemite in Time. Here they are visiting the shore of Lake Tenaya in 2020. Mark photographed Byron standing in the lake swatting flies. They positioned the camera so they could later insert Edward Mybridge's 1872 photograph on the left um, and do overlapping inserts sort of center right, um, of images made by Ansel Adams in 1942 and Edward Weston in 1937. This picture is part of an homage to Mybridge, Adams, and Weston, and also makes visible for viewers that in their heads, they know these images by other photographers. And when they make their own photographs, they're working with an awareness of others' pictures of these territories even if they don't choose to insert them. With the project Reconstructing View 2007-2010, they continued to work with known images from the 19th century and their own contemporary sightings. This is details from the view of Point Sublime on the north rim of the Grand Canyon, based on the panoramic drawings of William Holmes. But here they have reversed the placement. The original drawing is the drawing, not a photograph. The view of the Grand Canyon drawn by Holmes in 1882 is a panorama into which they now insert modern views. During two days in 2007, they made a thousand images at Point Sublime while consulting copies of Holmes's meticulous drawings. Once back in their rest respective states, they studied their pictures and exchanged digital files, finally deciding that their overviews, overlays, would be of, of transient moments in contrast to Holmes' thorough, still accurate renditions. Their single image color inserts shift the time of day, weather, vegetation, and changes in sunlight as it strikes the weathered rock situation. As with Panorama from a Sullivan, Pyramid Lake, their changes in Point Sublime highlight that change is relative to time, and time is an entity which exists only in relation to other entities such as change. Thank you. 
So, and thank um, you. Thank you very thank much. You so Seth. much. Wonderful. Um, so reeling from all these wonderful you know, thoughts. Um, it's a lot to digest. It's taken me years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, I think it's, I think it's so important to, um, as photographers, um, cease to, to, to reject the um, frozen moment of time as the only alternative for, for photography on one hand, if it's a straight photograph, and on the other as um, rejecting the photograph having anything to do in, uh, that has to do with knowledge with the real world and, and, and all the fictional and the created and the, the conceptual, which I'm not criticizing. I'm just saying that what I fascinates me about the work that these two wonderful photographers have produced over 40 years is that um, they started within the documentary tradition, but um, their pictorial curiosity pulled them away from what we might expect to see um, and push them to push us um, to, to understand how um, multiple views in, um, in, in the right composition can really give us, can really make something that we wanna contemplate. And I hope that some of you someday get to see both Terry's because those, those um, the new work at, are large scale and Mark and uh, the panoramas because, um, and I've had the pleasure of seeing that um, drawing that last one of, of Point Sublime. Um, you can spend hours. You, you, you know, it's like it's like Terry talking about standing an hour and looking at the grass. You can spend an hour looking at that picture, both at the extraordinary drawings, but also how just their photographing that same spot at a different time of day changed your perception, or change, yeah, it changed the perception of what the stone looked like. Um, so I think that both of them independently, but being well aware of each other's work too, um, have, have done one of the most intense explorations of this idea of the contemplation of extended time relative to what they're photographing. Um, and that's what I was trying to convey to you tonight. It's really amazing to see as you speak about extending extended time, because what does that even mean when we say time and what is it that makes time? And so are you able to hear me? Yeah. And so with the pictures that you were just showing us with uh, Mark and Byron's work and how they placed different times, right, of, of the same place as you're saying, and then the people to have people in a way that it's telling us that there's so much more involved and you're telling us this is somewhat of a family album, right? It's, a, it's the grand scale of the family album and, you're, and how his work is to be seen like, well, this is what anybody would see. It, it was a different type of work, are you saying? It wasn't Ansel Adams. And it's fascinating to see how just by placing that work there and themselves, it brings it. I, I've seen this book, I love the book, I love the work and I hadn't thought of it that way before. Well, and, and the other thing is, um, both of them are so knowledgeable about the history of the land. And that is, um, as close as they get to telling you that is Mark holding up the, the shards of the, the ceramic um, shards. Um, but um, they're, they're so aware of, of um, I mean, Terry can talk about the plains uh, and buffaloes and and transit and then settlement and you know I mean she can really <laughs> educate you about the history of the plains and whether or not 
the, that kind of knowledge is in the pictures, it certainly influences their, their um, respect for where they're standing and what they're photographing. And, and you know that the artist is standing there for a long time. And that is their view. And Terry's work, uh, the abstract, it's funny, you call them, I shouldn't say it's funny, but it's fascinating to me, the landscape images that are square. And we see the grasses side by side. Um, and you said landscape, and my mind went, landscape? Oh, right, OK. But I'm thinking abstract. And to me, of course, those are very different. But it was beautiful to see how there's that poetic nature with them, those two together. And then your, the other work, Terry, where you're, you're placing the images and showing the time, that's the first thing I think of is, wow, you're, you're there, you're spending time, you're now communicating, you were in that image, you were part of that. And uh, we see that, each photographer, who it is who's making it. What's, what's your feeling about that, Anne, in terms of what does it tell you about the artist's God, I just tried to get there. Um. <laughs> and then in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm in, in another level of, well, just sitting, just being there. I mean, it, I, I, of... I, I think that, you know, the invention, I didn't really talk much about it, although it's implicit, the invention of new perspectives, whether it's looking down at your feet um, or or whether it's um, this um, changing, um, changing, you know, the, the, the putting of a human for scale in the landscape is a great tradition. Um, putting the shards in his hand is a reversal of that, an exact reversal of that. The hand is bigger than the evidence. Um, and so, um, you know, it's a, it's a new approach to scale. Um, I mean, there's so many levels on which what seem to be simple pictures are actually highly informed. And I think my deep respect for both of them is that, um, that that being aware of the choices they're make they're making based on highly informed understanding of where they're standing. Are there other questions from people? Yeah, uh, actually, just, Deborah Kaplan um, has asked. Perhaps it is not just time, but time as memory held in simultaneity in the mind comment well yeah that's that's what i was trying to saying probably better what i was trying to say about the and what i love about that picture with mybridge and evans and adams because um you know every serious photographer i know is a photo book collector and they're they don't just have it for their bookshelf you you look at the books on their bookshelves, and you know um, you can tell when 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 the spine has where the finger has pulled it off the bookshelf. <laughs> that pic, you know that that book has sat in somebody's lap. It's it, it it so that that simultaneity of of having those. Um, those images of, of the people who've walked, who've literally, I mean, and the thing I love about Lake Tanaya, it's also means that Mybridge and Adams and Weston all walked there. You know, that perspective across the lake to those other sites, or, you know, that means that they are literally following in the footsteps. Um, and then challenging themselves to make a different kind of picture while acknowledging what was made before them. It's, it's I, you know, I love Byron's mashup idea, but it's more complicated than that. Is there another question? Did I, do you think I answered her question? Is that? 
does you know does she think I answered the question? <laughs> That's a good Do you question. Shake your head, or <laughs> you think she's good, or you just no? No, Wait, she has. Go ahead. Why don't you go ahead? Why don't you unmute yourself? Okay. Anybody else? Did she have? Did she want to I expand think she on did. it? Or? Douglas, are, are you able to? Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, let's well. See. If you yeah. can't, maybe oh, there's there, another question. There, now. there she is. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I was perhaps unclear. Um, yeah, yes, certainly in the historical um, photographs intertwined with the present day. I was also thinking about, for example, the image of a tree or prairie that was a composite that was not of a historical reference, but references to different times of day and seasons where the mind holds those things simultaneously. Yeah, I think that's a perceptive uh, understanding. Okay, I, I, I have another uh, another question for you. This from Suda House. Um, these images across time captured by Mark and Terry become today's interpretations of what is now our concerns with climate change. Um. I'm a little awkward answering for them since they're present. Um, I think that, um, you know, um, Terry just said the Burr Oak is 300 years old. Um, and so um, it, it, it's, a, it's a miracle that it's, that it's still um, alive and healthy and, and it, exists, but in part because it's it's respected. I mean, it's known that it's one of the oldest trees in, in Chicago. And also it, it's on land um, that Olmsted uh, put a, a water around it, but, but kept that island with the tree on it. So it's respected for lots of reasons. I mean, more layers. Um, so, um, I think that at least Terry is much more um, overt in her concerns for um, ecological change when she's photographing fracking in North Dakota, or certainly the series, um, the Culp brothers uh, had uh, these giant mounds of, of Petco uh and where they the 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 dust was literally blowing on people in neighborhoods you know giving children asthma um so she worked with the people in those neighborhoods to do that whole series so that series is on her website um and um um i think mark's closest um and, and one of the, the the series that I love is he's done a huge um, he's done a book on Suaro, the the cactus, you know, the, the sort of Arizona Arizona state plant. I don't know if it is, but it, both in terms of what uh, climate has done to it, but also in terms of what people have done to it, shooting it and uh, tying things on it, and you know, just thinking it's a stupid tree or cactus or, you know, um, so that um, without a political position, uh, Mark is, is using that, the, the attacks, weather-wise and other ways on, on these extraordinary plants um, that he's grown fond of in his years in the desert. Mark has said, yes, we work specifically with the idea, Rebecca Solnit, Byron Wolf, and I, in our project and book on Lake Powell, Drowned River, there is very, uh, absolutely, there it is very evident that almost any Western photo from the 19th century might be used to look for today's evidence of climate change. Absolutely. I mean, I should, I'm sorry, I, I should have thought about that because it was, they dammed up Lake Powell and now it's silted over. Um, and um, the water's dropping, and it. There, I mean, I, 
he's the person who understands it better, but it it's definitely, that is a very climate related project. Um, and, um, and he yeah. adds to that, that uh, the saguaros are also threatened by climate change. Well, would you, uh, I don't know, Anne or, or how Mark or Terry feel, it seems like they might want to share and do we, would we like to? Like yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm on questions that specific, I'm much more comfortable if one of them answered because I, although I've talked to them about these issues, I'm not the expert that, that they are. I had to put them on a spot, but I also don't want to give a dumb answer. Okay, well, I would, Terry. I would say um, that what I find in, in my own work now and have for the past several years is the um, deepening of understanding of the uh, um, industrial use of the landscape and how that affects people almost always people who are poor and who do not have a lot of power. And it is those people who are deeply affected by uh, industrial land use. And so that uh, awareness and engagement has meant a lot to me, but then then that has to be balanced, I think, with the land itself and, you know, with, uh, with that bur oak tree as an example. I, I was there to visit it today. I go there to visit it because it's, um, you know, it's 300 years old. It knows a lot more than I do. And it has a kind of wisdom that, that I don't understand. And so I find myself trying on the one hand to, um, to understand and become engaged with um, the, uh, with the damage that we humans are doing, not just to the earth, but to people themselves. So that on the one hand, and on the other hand, with an increasing feeling of, um, you might say, a kindred spirit with the, um, or a kinship, a kinship with that burrow tree and with the prairie grasses. I mean, it just, it makes me happy to be there and see them. And, you know, I really appreciated what, and what you said, I meant to say this at the very beginning, um, what you have done tonight, I appreciate so much. You know, I mean, there are a few things that mean as much as someone doing what you quoted Mary Zimmerman as saying that I do for the land, which is giving it, you know, you've given our work the kind of attention and sustained um, looking that, um, that I hope is what I'm doing with the landscape. And I really appreciate that so much. Thank you. It's a sharing, you know, it's it's because I love the work of both of them and have for years. So um, it's just um, it is an act of love that that kind of attention is an act of love. And, and I can extend that into my feelings about the work, the people, too, but the work. <laughs> Terry, thank you for, for sharing that. And I, I think I felt like when I'm watching and looking at that tree, that I'm standing there all that time, looking at little bits of it as well, because you've given us little bits. So you focus on one spot for some time, don't you? I'd love to hear uh, yeah. a meditative practice for you. I'm sure it has to be. I'm not in any formal sense, but um, it's, uh, it always, when I'm there, even this afternoon, right before I got inundated with a heavy rain, um, but you know, even then, it it just reminds me of how large our world really is, and how you know how much we have to do to remember that and pay attention to it. And uh, 
uh, you know, it's such a gift. That was kind of vague, but. <laughs> it's a feeling. It's a feeling that you have that brings you back all those hours. And, and each one of those larger pictures happens over a sustained period of time. So that many, many, many visits. But I'd like to hear from Mark. Too. Yes, thank you. Mark, you're, we'd love to hear from you. Oh, okay, I'll turn my video on. And Hi, I, welcome. I'm actually here. I wanna thank Anne for, uh, for what she said. And it was, it's an honor to be spoken of by you, Anne, and, and uh, in the way that you did. Uh, so that the questions were kind of evolving around climate change, but you know, I kind of take the long view on that because uh, you know, I think one of the things that's happened is that we um, as a species and as, as people, we don't take the long view. So we tend to think about um, things like climate change only in a way that it might affect us, you know, at this moment. And so we're looking for small indicators, you know, of how there might, climate might be changing, you know, like uh, the storms are getting worse or things like that. Um, we're actually, the, the, the thing when you look at the land, and this is maybe my geologic training, but, you know, there's evidence of long, much longer term evidence of things that have changed naturally, but also human inter intervention when you can look at it, say from the standpoint of, um, you know, a hundred and plus years that we at least have a record photographically in the, in the Western United States. So it's just a, a lot easier to um, take the short view than the long view. If we take the long view, evidence is even more damning. You know, I, I, I tend to think that we, we get too comfortable without these things. So, I mean, I, I, one of the things I would really like to do in the work is to get people to think beyond the short term, um, to think beyond um, their own life and the way time um, is measured. And when we were working on Yosemite, Rebecca Solnit and I and Byron uh, Wolf, um, we used to think, we used to talk a lot about time. And one of the things that I came to conclusion of was that um, we think about time, we think about change, and we think that change is, is the outcome of time. You know, time happens and it happens in some linear way that's kind of regular. And then change happens because of that. But I was beginning to get the idea that, that actually um, change and time were had a different relationship and that change was actually the real measure of time. You know, that you could measure um, time by the amount of change that happened. And sometimes when a lot of change happened, a lot of time happened. And when there was a, a little change, then sort of there was little time happened. And I think there was a different way to kind of look at that then I, then I think we tend to look at in, a, in our sort of linear thinking about what time is. So part of the work that I've been doing over, over my career is to kind of try to get a different perspective on what that relationship is between time and change. Thank you, Mark. And what is your, do you want to add something to that? You're good. Oh, are there any other questions? We I, don't would, have I would say, in, in terms of Mark, what you were just talking about, change in time, it's it's interesting because if one would think in terms of Eastern studies, uh, how time is measured, it, it is by change, right? It's the change. That's how we can see time. You can't really see time any other way. You can't. You can see a clock move, but that's not top clock. So you're showing you're showing us that in a way. And I, both of you, there's. The work is so much deeper than just looking, as we, you know, Anne pointed out, one image. It's, it's a collection of images that you're putting together. And with the homage to the other artists that, that you're using in this work also allows us to see the passage of time and how Anne, you mentioned, walking in the footsteps of those who had been there before him. And Mark, I know you spend a lot of time outside when, when you're photographing, like you go away and you just camp out, don't you? Oh, I, I love camping. <laughs> Any chance I can get. <laughs> yeah. Well, is there anything else anybody would like to share? I know we still have time. Uh, Anne, maybe you can show us that wonderful book that you have. It's uh, a rare out of print image that Anne is generously well, I, donating. I sort, of, I sort of hate to bring war, although it is one of the great district, um, the, 
Anybody who buys it to the auction better be strong. Um, <laughs> I've, I promised Anne, but only ask her to hold it up once today. I've, I've forgotten. It's uh, 600 pages. Um, oh, wow. But um, it's it was a, a project um, that took us over. There were three of us, and um, we just felt like we were riding a tiger. The project took it over, and it just kept growing. So, um, but I think the pictures are greater than any of the words, but it's an extraordinary collection of photographs, and it's an expanded version of war photography. It's not just battle. It's it's civilians and and land and um, hospitals and um, the the beginning of war and and the training for war and I mean we really took it from a broad perspective. Um, so the book is organized in the order of war, and then in each of those categories you have um, you know medical from the earliest pictures known up to the present. Um, but anyway, I'll sign it and, um, if somebody Thank wants you. it and you all yeah. can support the raffle. There's, thank you. Yeah. There's still time for people want to enter the raffle, but and what got you started doing that book in particular? Um, actually my colleague, Will Michaels did, a, a small show, um, of, uh, war photographs that we had in the collection. And I was, I hadn't realized that, you know, one by one by one, we had collected as many as we did. And um, we, we started um, with the idea of, 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 of a modest show, uh, you know, a normal size show, 100, 150 prints. Um, but um, fortunately, at that time, I had a director who had gotten a simultaneous double PhD in art history and history at the University of Chicago. Um, and so he was very interested in the history aspect, I mean, the, the idea of, the, of history. Um, and um, we were very fortunate to bring in, I mean, I didn't know anything about war. Um, or military, and but with Hillary Roberts at the Imperial War Museum and the director of the Military Museum in, in Austin, um, and um, my very own Robert, we'd be sitting, um, you know, watching a movie, and he'd say, "What that guy rank? What kind of plane is that?" You know. So I was getting um, educated there too. But it was I the thing that the the real reason. I wanted to do it is because I thought that two things were happening. One, there was um, a liberal, liberal art critics were, uh, because they hated war, didn't like pictures of war, as though we should dismiss them. Um, and in fact, the worst, the most savage review we got was somebody who said we spent too much time talking about the soldiers and not enough time talking about the victims. Well, that's not a balanced book. Uh, it's not a balanced history. Um, and I hated the fact that I wanted to come up with a new structure because I hated the fact that history of war books were Fenton went to the Crimea and that was a chapter. And then there were the people that went to India and there was a, that was a chapter. And then there was the Civil War. You know, it, it, you didn't learn anything about war. And um, we, we started just going to archives all over the world. And our criteria was what were the best pictures? We just, we'd see a picture. We didn't know, we just, we came home with these pictures and we started putting on the board. And we came up with the idea of the order of war, and then we got a National Endowment for Humanities grant, and we got these war historians, and that's how they write history. So we changed the way you write a history about war photography, um, and I am told that it is now a more 
standard way among young young curators to to take that perspective and i'm you know that's that's great because i think that i think you can um take out sections and make more uh I think your curiosity has more places to go with that structure than the prior structure. And that curiosity of future curators is the most important thing. Um, you know, I always say that when the young curators go back in the stacks and they find this box and they come out and they say, look at this work, do you know this work? Well, until five years ago, I put it there. But I never said that because the important thing was for them to discover it. And, and the thing is not only have they discovered it, they're gonna see it differently because they don't read the same books and they don't listen to the same movie and they don't look at the same movies and their perceptions of that work, talking about time and change, young curators' perceptions of the same work I bought 40 years ago is different. And that's the way it should be. I mean, that's art. That is what art is. It, really good art um, is about, can sustain curiosity. Great art can sustain curiosity. Um, and so that's exciting. Didn't mean to get a lecture. But anyway, that's no, what it, well, because we want to know now. This is an out of print book. So what made it out of print? I mean, there's something very special and historical about this book. Did, did it have more than one? Edition? We had three printings. Yeah, there wow. were three printings. I mean, it's not like it's not like bestseller printings. I mean, there were 2000 copies per printing. So it's only 6000 books. But still in the photo book, I mean, we all laugh that when I went into the field 50 years ago, we printed 1500 copies of a book. Now we still print photo books at 1,500 to 1,000 copies and 50 years later. I mean, that's what the audience is. So it's not a, you know, great. Okay, anybody else? Um, yeah, we actually do Mark have and a, Terry, thank you. I'm so, I so appreciate you all jumping in. Um, it makes it richer. Um, we have a que question from uh, Granville Carroll. Um, I wonder if both Terry and Mark think about time in different perspectives perhaps in terms of motion, vibration, and expansion, or even in terms of stagnation, how these are intertwined in the landscape and our experience of them. Feel free to unmute yourself, Terry or Mark. Mark or Terry, either one of you. Oh, Sorry. I think we're, there, there, there we go. go. Um, well, I was thinking about uh, how I, you, you know, that, uh, well, I mean, Mark's photographs, of course, show this better than anything, but I was thinking when, when I fly now, I can tell by the marks on the landscape, uh, I, I can see the evidence of time on it. I can tell if a field has been uh, plowed and abandoned if a pasture has been overgrazed and left uh, unrestored. Um, so I think uh, so. I think that in a, I remember um, reading about an early 13th century Christian mystic Bonaventure who talked about uh, reading God's creation. Well, you know, I wouldn't put it exactly that way but i do think we can read the land we can read the land and the use uh that has come to it and has been made of it and, and by the same token we can tell when land has been cared for and restored yeah, I, I don't know if i ever thought of it in quite those terms uh, but um i did a series of pictures one time what i called uh, time studies where one of the things that I was interested in was that I think cameras can record time in different ways than, or photography can record times in different ways than the human brain can understand it. And one of the things about the history of photography was that there was always this kind of desire to, uh, you know, make shorter and shorter exposures. 
you know, to where we could use strobes and stop bullets in flight and stuff like that. And I, I was actually really interested in the early part of the history of photography where, you know, when somebody made a daguerreotype, you know, the, the early daguerreotypes, you know, they'd show a street scene, you wouldn't see anybody on the street because they were so long that everybody moved, you know. And I got this, this interesting idea that, you know, one of the things that, that photography can do really well is make um, long exposures. And so, I mean, there are some really good examples of that. The German photographer, Michael Wesley, for example, has done, you know, like three-year exposures and things like that. And they're, they're pretty amazing pictures. Um, and I was just trying to learn how to make, you know, one or two-day exposures and, and interval exposures and stuff like that. But I, I think that um, we just don't perceive a lot of things that are beyond our normal attention. And that one of the great things about photography, it's an, an ideal tool to sort of investigate that. So um, just, I think, I, I guess I think about time in terms of things like um, moments, intervals, um, you know, things that you can't capture, uh, the evidence of things that where you see something that, have, that happened, but there's no evidence that nobody saw it. Um, so it's things like that that I do think about that I, I think are about time. Thank you both. Yeah, it's every, every, everything that you, you mentioned, I see everyone's shaking their heads in different ways. Like the perception that we're having of your perception versus then another perception. And uh, I think that's something that you spoke about earlier, just the perception. And, who is the person standing in their shoes that's seeing the work or thinking of creating the work or even hearing about how you're saying it? We all have so many different perceptions. Uh, I, we got a lovely message from, let's see, Saul of Bromberger. He says, thanks so much to Anne, Mark, and Terry for a wonderful presentation that got me to think of nature, uh, nature photography in a new way, a fresh and inspiring approach for me. Uh, do we have any last questions or? We, yeah, we actually, any... yeah, I was just, I have one question for Mark. Um, I, I, I'm curious because you, you've worked a lot with the work of other um, photographers. How much do you feel like you were actually collaborating with them in some way when you were doing that work? You could unmute yourself and respond. Yeah. Oh, I got to tell you, I got a train outside here. So if you see a train going, if you hear a train, that's because <laughs> where my studio is. Uh, sorry about that. No uh, but yeah, I mean, that's interesting, Douglas, because I, I've often, I used to say to uh, to uh, Rebecca and Solomon or Byron, whoever we're working with, you know, like we're working with, uh, you know, Moybridge here, working with uh, Edward Weston or Ansel, <laughs> making them unwitting, maybe unwilling collaborators in the work that we're doing. And, and so we would embed, you know, their pictures into ours. The, the, it's not hard to do because the, their pictures are out there. Um, the only thing that, that the collaboration runs in afoul of is these days you have to deal with the trust. <laughs> so if we use uh, Ansel Adams work, you know, that's not in the public domain, which some of it is, um, then we have to go to the trust, you know? And so there's things like that uh, where, <laughs> maybe it's easier to work with a, with a live collaborator where you can talk to them face to face. But yeah, I thought about that a lot. I call them un, unwitting or unwilling collaborators. Right, right. Thanks. It just made me want to think of one more thing for, for both uh, Terry and Mark, and the idea of scale and, and the work and how, you know, the large, large images that you made. Did you think of it going into it while you were making the work that it had to be large because it was large because these are landscapes or how how is it that you saw that progression well um i think the work itself always directs what has to happen next and so i i didn't have any preconceptions about what any of any of my projects needed to be in terms of size beforehand. And when I started doing this most recent work, I think I kind of, for, for one outlet for it, I kind of um, cut myself out because these large ones 
I don't think will look very would look very uh, effective on at a book scale. You know, they almost need to be seen uh, large. Um, actually, I'll show you one. Um, can you see this? Yes. Okay. This is in my dining room and, and Sam's in my dining room. Well, anyway, you get the idea. Um, you almost have to be able to move through it, but I didn't know that. I didn't know I was going to be putting all these images together and constructing these. I didn't, that's not what I planned to do. Um, I didn't plan, I don't plan in advance very much, which I think I'd be interested to hear from Mark because I think his work requires a lot more planning in terms of the uh, images that have historical uh, historical inserts. Every one of his do, it seems to me, and yet he, he, he always has room for the intuitive response too. So that's interesting. But anyway, so I, I, um, I do think a lot about scale, but, it's, but I, I think about it as the work moves me into it. Uh, some, sometimes we're limited by the size of, an, of, an, of a piece. We're working with a historic piece, but, but I couldn't wait to get into a bigger scale. And when we started moving into digital, um, you know, that's something that Byron and I were working on with, with the work in the Grand Canyon. Um, we had done this work in Yosemite and we went to this uh, exhibition of Yosemite work in, at the uh, Nevada Museum of Art. And we were sitting in the gallery looking at this really incredible 19th century painting by Bierstadt or somebody. Um, and it was, I don't know, it was big. It was probably like six feet by eight feet or something like that. And, and Byron says, uh, you know, we ought to do that. <laughs> and it was great. <laughs> you know, we, we were looking at uh, all these little people and these little things and we were saying, we could do that, you know? But, but we weren't uh, working with um, the digital equipment then wasn't that great, but we were just starting to use a medium format digital back that, you know, was like 28 megapixels, which doesn't sound like a lot these days. But um, what we could, do, we could, you know, do these composites, you know, it's kind of like what Terry's doing, but we, we were intentionally stitching them together so that they were flawless, you know. So we could, we could do this um, flawless stitching and we did this in the Grand Canyon where we made this piece that was like six feet by nine feet um, big. It was, it was the biggest piece we could get printed in the United States actually. And, and it could go even bigger. We, we did one that was like billboard size. Yet if you looked at it, the detail was just incredibly sharp because every little piece was done with this little zoomed in section. And the great thing about it was that when we created this, one of them we did out of 56 different photographs um, that we could go back and repeat certain pictures. So we were following somebody kind of going down the trail into the Grand Canyon and have a red shirt. And we could populate that with that person going back into different locations. So it was all, it was kind of this huge piece that looked like it was done at one piece of, in time, like one moment in time, but it was actually made up of 56 different pieces. And we could sort of reconstitute the, this story or this narrative of this person going down the canyon. It was a little bit like um, Japanese Amaki scrolls, you know, where you kind of move through the scroll and it goes and, and it moves through space and time. And that was sort of this combination of looking at like a 19th century uh, view by Bierstadt, you know, and then looking at a Japanese Amaki scroll and kind of combining them together and looking at that idea of, of kind of moving through space and time. So I, but I, I think it had to be big, you know, so we, we really couldn't do that um, until we got into digital and, and you know now it's like well, you know it's not that not that difficult to go big anymore so how did you choose the images it, it, that obviously well, I can't, i'm saying obviously in my head i think i'm going one way you if you have that that large painting and how do you know which peaks you're going to go to or which parts of the image you're then going to add to well byron when we were working together i would operate the camera and he was recording stuff so he had like a little chart and he would, we would do like, um, it was eight across and seven down, so it was 56. And then, so we would, he would label those and, and uh, you know, he'd say, um, you know, like you could, you could do another shot of that person in, 
you know, column X and row Y. And then you could, you know, so I could, I knew where that was because I had a coordinate on it, you know, like so many clicks up and down and so many things around the side. You know, somebody commented, it was like a uh, John Devola's Gigapan work in the text. I haven't seen John's work on that, but this was before we, before Gigapan even existed because, uh, and we couldn't use Gigapan because it was, um, we were using medium format, those big clunky cameras. So we had to devise our own method, but, uh, but there is like Gigapan's often automated. We were doing it manually. So we just did a chart. You know, anytime you do a panorama, it's just like mapping space. It's like, you know, it's just like, here's a map of the space, especially if you stitch people, things together, like Terry's pictures are maps, you know, and you can go back. The great thing about it is you can go back and redo it at a different time. So it's like, it, once you have the map, it's repeatable because the space is, you can reoccupy the space. Time's different, that's the, that's the big change. If that makes sense, I, you know. Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying about Terry's because it, it's interesting. I'm seeing the, the, the large tree and then how you place the different bits in there. And you could go back, you could take, you know, however you've done it at a certain iteration and then create another one and then make it even more different. Like, how did you even know when to stop and, and why not even keep going, right? Okay, oh, excuse me. Yeah, there we go. Take the moment. Sorry for the delay, everybody. There, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I keep muting it when somebody else is talking and then I can't unmute it. So here I am. Um, but, um, you know, I do think of mine as uh, like a map, but a different kind of map. It's, it's this map that happens in your mind as you move through a place. And uh, the images in mine are not replicas of that tree or that prairie. Um, they are compiled over many visits and then I have a whole trove of images and I think, all right, this is about the end of spring. It's starting to look like summer. I better start making a picture out of these. And so then I start, but, and I usually will sort of start with something in the middle and then I'll work on one side and then another side and and I will keep attaching images and I will make some smaller and some larger. Um, so, uh, uh, so and, and I make lots of changes and I abandon it a lot of times. I don't mean I abandon the whole picture, I abandon changes and I make other changes. So, um, so in Photoshop, I may have, you know, I may have 85 layers. Um, but some of them I have, uh, many of them I have um, not used and replaced. Um, so, so, so it becomes more a process in my studio that is similar to my experience when I'm there. You know, it's, it's a process of, um, I'm sorry, I'm not feeling very articulate about this, but it's it's a process of um, the, the process of making the picture is just as much fun and just as unknowing and just as um, cumulative as the experience of being there and trying to know the place or the tree or the prayer. you're putting your you're inserting yourself in in different stages on the in the field you're inserting yourself and then in a different way in your interpretation in post i think that's it yeah well, thank you and and thank you for tonight and and uh this wonderful talk with with mark and terry we appreciate your poetic sensibilities we appreciate your time. Uh, thank you for donating your book. Thank you all who've donated, who've been here tonight. We appreciate your time. And uh, we should say, so uh, I know that uh, Douglas mentioned for Open Show, uh, Rollins is uh, curating this event and the theme is change. And uh, what do you, how do you see change?
through uh, the lens. I think that's appropriate from what we've seen tonight. How do you capture a state of flux? So have at it, enjoy it, and enjoy uh, yourselves. Thank you. We're getting a lot of wonderful notes from everybody. And um, we thank you all for being here. And have a lovely night. Wait, wait, there's more. This will be on YouTube. <laughs> we'll post it next week. And if you uh, are not on our list for Pasadena Photography Arts, please do so, so, so you'll find out more. We have wonderful speakers. And thank you again. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, so much. Mark. Thanks, Sarah. It's been great. And everybody. Bye.